and we're officially live. So my name is Ryan Van Riper. I'm the marketing manager at Therapedia, and today we're going to be talking about running. I'm going to have everyone go around and introduce themselves. That's joining us on the panel today. So Nicole Haas, I'll have you start. I am Nicole Haas. I'm the clinic director at Therapedia Boulder. I have been practicing PT about 15 years, and I've been working uh, pretty exclusively with runners um, and athletes over the past 10. I have uh, had the opportunity to be involved in research at USC um, in the biomechanics of the hip and the knee, uh, and that research eventually developed into use with runners. I've also been involved with uh, UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, and helping them start a program called RunSafe which is, was intended to evaluate healthy runners. It became a multidisciplinary team approach to evaluating runners, uh, not uh, so pain-free runners. Um, and then I teach uh, Con Ed. I teach PTs uh, nationally how to uh, perform running analysis and how to apply evidence into their practice. And I also teach for University of Colorado um, Denver, their PT program on the same topic. Great. Thanks, Nicole. And uh, Jason? Yes, my name is Jason Villarreal. I am the clinical director at Therapedia Portland, and I've been practicing physical therapy for the past eight years. And my background, actually, prior to PT was in sports medicine, where I worked as an athletic trainer uh, in the high school collegiate level down in Orange County at UC Irvine. And uh, after working in athletic training and sports medicine for a short amount of time, uh, I wanted to branch out and start physical therapy. So I actually had an opportunity to work and study under Nicole uh, while she was at USC, which was awesome. And in my PT career, I've uh, gravitated towards athletics since my background is in sports medicine and have had an opportunity to work with some professional and Olympic athletes and I have integrated a little bit of the uh, high-speed video analysis into my practice while also containing some manual therapy and movement motor control issues to uh, make people more efficient at their movement. So that's what we do out in Portland. Great. Thanks, Jay. And mm -hmm. Chris Johnson, I'll have you introduce yourself. You're actually the seasoned veteran of PTTVs of the group. Um, so why don't you tell us about yourself? Well, I sort of feel like the uh, the odd person out here. I'm the only one who uh, is not directly affiliated with Therapedia now. So, you know, I <laughs> a very feel, welcomed addition. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, I feel honored to be included, and I uh, appreciate Jay and Nicole taking the time, and you, Ryan, as well, for uh, for sort of emceeing the uh, this uh, this hangout. Um, I spent the first, well, I did my training at University of Delaware and spent a lot of time in Lynn Snyder Mackler's lab and ended up at uh, the Nicholas Institute of Sports Medicine and Athletic Trauma in New York. Um, and I was there for roughly eight or nine years. Um, I was doing clinical work as well as research work. Uh, Nismat's a really amazing place. They uh, pump out tons of great research. And I used to pretend I knew about running. I'm slowly starting to figure it out. Um, but, you know, when I was in New York, I, I spent a lot of time just combing through the literature as well as running. I do a lot of uh, racing and specifically long course racing. And I sort of morphed a lot of my writing, my video work, um, research, and clinical practice into managing the injured multi sport athlete. And I think it's something that a lot of folks um, wind up seeing endurance athletes, namely runners but we never get any formal training on it. Um, I can't think of any specific program that really hits a nail on the head, and I think that um, things are starting to take a, a little bit of a turn, uh, but I think there's really a disconnect between um, clinicians and researchers right now, and I mean, I think hopefully the move is to start bridging that gap because it's it's ultimately the patient that gets caught in between and ends up getting suboptimal care. So that's sort of my mission, and uh, I think we're on the same page there, uh, hopefully. And yep. uh, I look forward to discussing things. Thanks, Chris. Well, we're really thrilled to have you on board today. Um, so I'm just going to, oh, first I wanted to remind anyone who's watching, if you do have any questions or comments for us, I'm going to be checking the feed on Twitter. So um, just use the hashtag TherapediaRunTalk all together. 
um, with the pound symbol, and that will alert me that you've asked a question or left a comment, and I can bring those up throughout the broadcast. So the first question that I have, and Chris, I'm going to direct this one back at you. Um, what is your general approach to evaluating a runner? What tools do you use, and what programs? Uh, so that's a, you know, I'll try and avoid taking up too much time answering this. <laughs> I, mean, I think the thing that you have to understand about running is that running has a very predictable set of performance demands, okay? And there's also equipment issues that can't be overlooked. So you need to make sure that when someone comes in, I have very specific questions that I answer. And, it's, and this is a system that I apply to pretty much any runner. First and foremost, are there any red flags? We cannot miss red flags as PTs and direct access. From there, you have to say, is this a pain problem or a tissue problem? One of the biggest mistakes that you can make is to, and, and I also should say that most runners are not chronic pain patients, they're mismanaged, and they get dubbed chronic pain patients. So making sure that you understand, is there a tissue problem or is this a pain problem? All right, Adrian Lau's done some great work as well as David Butler, Laura Mermosley, uh, and I'm excluding a few names. Of apologies to those folks. And then from there, is this an equipment issue? Okay, so really figuring out where where someone falls along that spectrum, and then to look at the performance demands of running. And I, you know, I've said this before on the Therapedia TV um, shows. You know, you have to be able to load through the affected region. You have to be able to balance in a wobble-free manner. You have to be able to progress the leg over the foot, which requires about 20 degrees of isolated dorsiflexion. Um, you should have roughly 30 degrees of MTP motion, otherwise you're going to get compensatory motions. Not to be mis mistaken that that's going to automatically lead to pain, but you should anticipate compensations. Um, you need good lateral hip and trunk stability, and you need good reciprocity of motion before being able to hop in multi-directions on each leg. And from there, just to make sure that someone knows how to put their shoes and socks on and returns in a sort of a graded exposure approach. Got it. Thanks. Jason, what about you? Chris, that was great information. Uh, I come from a school of knowledge where uh, I've had the opportunity to take a few... Uh, extended continuing education courses under Dr. Christopher Powers at USC and uh, one of them notable mention was the uh, uh, advanced functional biomechanics of the lower quarter um, where we really you know we integrate high-speed technology to uh, use it as a tool to assess the runner um, but even backing up before we do the assessment of the runner uh, we really, as clinicians, we study gait, and gait is one of those most um, standardized, if you want to call it, movements within our practice and our field. So uh, taking the clinical experience that we have and all the biomechanical knowledge and uh, doing a, a thorough gait evaluation, uh, I use in the clinic personally a, a, a specific gait analysis whether it be with video or not, to figure out if there are some objective things that are going to stick out during a higher speed, um, either running or more dynamic movement. Uh, because if there's objective limitations within their gait, then it's probably going to stick out within their running. And I'm using the high speed video um, in the clinic to basically prove or disprove my theory um, after taking the appropriate history and, and um, background information from that athlete. So uh, I would obviously agree with the things that Chris has said it, uh, and then really tie in that we're, we're going to do, in our clinic, we're going to do a thorough gait analysis before we even step into running because they may be set up for failure uh, if they're having some specific functional movement limitations in, in a normal activity such as just walking. Um, so that's what we kind of include in our assessment for the, the higher level patient. Got it. And Nicole? Great information uh, from both of you guys. I think I'm going to take this question just from a slightly different angle um, because I do incorporate uh, both of what you have, uh, what both of you have discussed. I think um, 
being someone who had one foot previously had one foot in the research world and now has all feet, both feet in the clinic. Um, one of the biggest challenges I think for and Chris mentioned this at the get-go is trying to incorporate evidence into practice and trying to bridge the gap between the researcher and the clinician. And so I spend a lot of time uh, teaching on that topic. That's actually what I taught for um, EPTA at last year's um, CSM, the previous years. I, I taught a run course with uh, Brian Heiderscheidt and Irene Davis, if you guys are watching. Um, and my role was to discuss how to do a run analysis uh, and what tools you need in the clinic for the clinician themselves. And so I have been spending a lot of time trying to see what do you really need. And, and Chris mentioned this as well. You need certain tools. You need a treadmill if you're going to do a run analysis. And you do need some way to video capture. Jay sort of alluded to this uh, as well, that our, our eyes, as much as we would love to think that we can, we can gather the information that we need just from eyeballing it, research does show that between even master clinicians, we don't always match and we don't catch, uh, we don't catch the things that we need to. So I personally uh, have gravitated towards um, a program called Ubersets. Um, because it allows me to slow things down, and I'm sure both of you are familiar uh, with that program. Um, it allows sort of a side-by-side, -side, and I'm saying this more for those watching uh, than the faces I'm staring at on here, but Ubersense allows you to side-by-side -side, uh, comparison between videos. So if you have somebody that you are going to do a education session with, you can look at the before and after. And if you have someone that you're going to see down the line after they've been strengthening or after they've been working on things you've given them, it also allows them to uh, compare side by side. It allows you to drop um, plumb line kind of things that uh, we like to look at angles um, and we like to look at uh, orientation and space. And so I think the, the tools that I use in the clinic right now are a treadmill, an iPad or uh, some sort of uh, smartphone device that I can use UberSense or video capture with. Um, and then I incorporate all of the things that the two of you have discussed. You know, I think uh, one of the other challenges, and we might be getting into this as we discuss things further, is knowing what research does show we should look at and what we know as clinicians through experience, uh, what patterns we see over and over again. That's our big challenge right now, I think, in the research uh, and clinician world. Ryan, can I add something? Please do. Um, I think all of us said somewhat similar things, but I, I just want to emphasize that um, the question being tools. Uh, all of these things, whether they're uh, you know accessible via iPad or iPhone or uh, a fancy camera system, are just tools. And, and really what differentiates a good clinician, like all of the people on the panel here, from someone who just picks up an iPhone or iPad is that you're using the tool with clinician's knowledge to give that patient the total package assessment of what's wrong. And, and with running, because it's such a challenge and there's so many different types of running, biomechanically and, and, and favored styles, whether it be treadmill or overground or trail, whatever it be, it's really up to the clinician to utilize their tools to make a proper assessment for that runner or that athlete. And so we may we can talk about tools probably all day long, and there's some that are tens of thousands and some that are just maybe 50 bucks, but or even 10 bucks like an app. But uh, I just want for the audience more specifically to know that if you are looking for someone to give you a proper assessment that Tools are not necessarily the thing that's going to give you the answer. It's more the clinician who uses those tools and how they use those tools. Yeah, and that's actually a perfect lead-in for my next question. Uh, Jay, I'll direct it at you first. Okay. It was going to be, what is different um, about performing a running analysis compared to a more classic strength and flexibility assessment? And additionally, how do you feel a run assessment by a physical therapist differs from that of another practitioner? Um, so you're sort of uh, getting there anyway, but maybe sure. you can answer well, that. Well, um, not to discredit, uh, you know, there's a lot of providers, and, and, and by, what I mean by providers, it could go from uh, a doctor to even your um, 
you know, your local store that has a foot pad where someone stands on it and then they have a employee who may not know anything biomechanically about the body or the, the athlete and give someone advice on what type of shoe or, or accessory to use for their sport. And I think as physical therapists, we have a little bit higher uh, advantage because of our educational background within school. And then what I would say, I feel I'm very confident in my skill set, but with the two other clinicians uh, on the panel here, that really tie in the evidence-based components to what we're doing in the clinic, you're not going to find that with someone who works in a store or someone who possibly isn't focused on the movement analysis or the biomechanics or the research or whatever it may be. Uh, and that's, I think, what separates us is that we are the specialists in movement and also getting someone to move properly. That being said, with runners, uh, I've had all sorts of runners, whether it be forefoot, midfoot, and heel strike. And from what I've learned, uh, I've, I've strayed away from changing a style of running, whether they're, you know, a specific, they, they have a preferred style of running, unless it's really detrimental to their biomechanics. Meaning if they're coming to see me with pain and I see something that's faulty within their certain phases of, whether it be loading or, or uh, a peak knee flexion or a hip excursion or whatever it may be, uh, if there's something that I pick up during their motion analysis that's going to make them pain-free or better, then I'll make a suggestion, and I still won't change their style, but I'm giving them options of how to become more efficient with less pain. And I think that's what separates us from other providers. Yeah. Chris, do you want to weigh in on that question at all? What makes a running analysis from a physical therapist different from other providers? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that Jason, you know, sort of hit the nail on the head there. I mean, when someone comes to see me, I've put them through, I mean, really, I spend a lot of time talking about their past medical history, which if someone were to collect that with me, they would need a full hour. I mean, they literally <laughs> need to go through that. Um, so when you collect someone's past medical history, you're already saying, okay, what are the implications of this injury? What are the risk factors um, associated with this injury? What are the common you know, areas that go incompletely rehabbed? You're taking them through a systematic uh, evaluation, and you're basically trying to say, based on all this information, if they're really ready to even do a treadmill analysis, which in most cases are not right off the bat, very rarely do I have someone come in that I put on a treadmill. I mean, that's something that maybe, maybe I get to in the third or fourth visit, but it sort of depends on the nature of their presentation. Mm -hmm. But we already have an idea of how we anticipate this person should be running based on all the information, the objective measures that we collected. So it's sort of basically confirming or disproving our working hypothesis. And sometimes you get surprised when you throw them on a treadmill, but you know, it's physical therapists, and I think there are some other folks within the medical community, but we're really well positioned to work with any individual because we're trained across all these different systems. And I think as the research emerges, which, you know, again, a lot of physical therapists are behind. I mean, Irene, Brian Heiderscheidt, um, or two of the big names, um, you know, Ferber, um, we can go on and on. So a lot of the PTs are contributing to the literature that's helping our understanding or refining our understanding of the running gait. So um, I think that we sort of look at things a little, bit, a little bit more globally and we're starting to basically infuse some of the pain science and it puts us in a great position to help people, so especially runners who are notoriously plagued with injury. Right. Nicole, any thoughts on that topic? You guys gave great, uh, great insight into that. I think, um, I think PTs, we are the biomechanical experts of the medical world, and I think, you know, as both of you alluded to, that puts us in a great position. You know, we have the education, we have the background. Most of us who work with this crowd have spent extra time on top of our schooling um, to be more proficient at analyzing the mechanics and the running pattern. And I think, you know, as Chris said, 
being well versed across the breadth of the human body. You know, to become a physical therapist, we learn all the systems. Uh, we don't just learn orthopedics, we learn neurology, we learn pathology, uh, which puts us at a place to not only observe mechanics that might lead to an injury, um, and also when somebody is moving to analyze what in their movement pattern is feeding their injury or contributing to it. And I think that that does put the quality of the run analysis at a much different level uh, than practitioners who might have a lot of experience. Um, you know, I call it the anecdotal evidence. Uh, a lot of times we've had a lot of experience in a certain thing and therefore we want to share that experience and almost share it as a uh, known entity, um, almost like applying it as research. And I think PTs are very good at sorting through what is research uh, and what is anecdotal and what is clinical practice experience. Um, and I think we draw on all of those different tabs as we're analyzing a patient and working with a patient. And so I think that does make us stand out and set up as a perfect, um, a perfect field to be doing the run analysis and to be helping the patients as much as we can. Great. Well, my next question, Nicole, I'm going to direct towards you. What do you think are the limitations um, or challenges when performing a run analysis in the clinic? This is, this is definitely one I deal with um, quite a bit. Um, you know, and as I alluded to before, this is what I've been asked to teach um, when I am talking with PTs and trying to bridge that gap between the research world and between the clinic world. Um, Jason had discussed the tools. We have, there's lots of tools that can be used, and some are um, expensive and some are not so expensive. And I think in, in the clinic, if you're in an academic setting, you might have funds and you might have access to get uh, the cameras and to get the force plates and to get uh, the fancy programs. And then when you are in a clinic where you don't have those funds, that's where the challenge, I find a lot of people reach out to me asking, well, how can I do a run analysis if I don't have all the fancy tools? Uh, and I think that um, it takes a lot to stay abreast of the current research, even if you're trying. And I think part of the challenge right now in the world of physical therapy, and especially with running, is this is all developing. You know, I've been in it from the get-go um, when I did my post-professional doctorate with Chris Powers. That was sort of when people weren't really talking about it yet, and they weren't even really talking about hip strengthening uh, in relation to knee pain. And now my students uh, sort of laugh when I told them I had to process through that uh, when I was a new clinician. That's sort of common knowledge now. Um, but I think with running mechanics, it's sort of at that same stage. You know, I think there's some great research that is coming out, and Irene uh, Davis and Brian Heiderscheidt are definitely um, two of the pushers in that field. But I think a lot of it is still developing. And so I think the challenge is knowing when to apply that research uh, and when to know that it's still developing. Um, and so that, I think, is the, the biggest challenge in the crossover, the tools and what you have access to and then knowing what research is still developing and what is actually known and when to, when to apply it. Um, but I think the, the best thing I've heard so far is that it doesn't matter what tools you have, Jason sort of said it there, it's the clinician making the decisions and the differential diagnosis on how to apply the tools that is really the most important. Right. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, Chris, what kind of challenges do you face? In terms of limitations or challenges of conducting a running analysis? Yes. Um, you know, I, I think, again, Nicole mentioned this. I mean, it's one thing if you're in an instrumented, you know, lab that you have a force plate, you have access to EMG, you know, you, all, you sort of have all the bells and whistles. I don't think that's, you know, necessary nor practical for a lot of clinicians and, you know, they may not be even able to really make sense of what they're looking at or how to apply that information. Um, I think that's obviously something that lends itself to, you know, to research very well. I mean, in the clinic, I think, you know, you need very minimal equipment. The technology continues to evolve. Um, so I think the main thing in terms of limitations I I don't I don't know I don't really I, I guess I don't run into a lot of limitations I mean I use a, a professional grade camera I have a tripod I have a very specific system 
uh, of looking at things in terms of different views. I'll typically, you know, look at obviously, you know, from basically the level of the treadmill up to the trunk from a posterior view, then I'll do sort of head to toe, then I'll get a lateral view, and then I'll go to, you know, an anterior view. So I don't really run into a lot of limitations, I guess. So, yeah. um, you know, the thing that I see happening with a lot of people is suddenly everyone's doing run, running analysis. And I think that's a function of PTs getting pressed by insurance providers, you know, and they start offering this as sort of, you know, fee for service. Um, outside of, you know, maybe working with a, an injured runner, they may be trying to get healthy runners coming in and, and doing a treadmill analysis. So, nice. you know, that's, that's one of the issues that I see because I think a lot of the folks that are conducting this are finding things that aren't really that meaningful or shouldn't really be addressed. Um, so, and I think it's something that suddenly everyone's become a, a running expert and everyone's a, you know, a running analysis guru and, uh, you know, I, I don't think that that's necessarily what we should be emphasizing. I think it helps to do video analysis um, for runners to get feedback because a lot of times what they think they're doing versus what they actually are doing are very different things. I know this is particularly the case with swimming when I work with uh, swimmers. So I think feedback is important. And any time someone takes the time to watch and reflect and try and make sense of a situation, that's going to facilitate a path to recovery because they're being critical of how they move. So I, I you know, to answer your question, I don't think I, I run into a lot of limitations. Obviously, you know, there are certain things I'm curious to know that, you know, some of the technology that I'm applying in a, you know, a 45-minute block may not afford me, but I also don't think that in any way, shape, or form hinders my outcomes with these patients. Yeah, that makes sense. So just as a follow-up, you're not really trying to attract people who are just runners that want to see if there's anything they're doing or take preventative measures, sort of, if it's not broke, don't fix it approach, or you do want people coming in preventatively? Uh, I think that everyone's walking around with certain risk factors, and <laughs> the research, you know, there's still a lot to, you know, to learn. Um, I think a lot of things are habits. That's what I'm trying to foster with runners. I mean, I sort of, you know, scratch my head sometimes because the things that I see that we really need to focus on with runners is motor control and just simple habits. I mean, I watch runners put their socks on, put their shoes on, tie their shoes, and I want to jump off a bridge. You know? <laughs> why is that? For a non-PT, why is that? Just... Well, because, you know, if you rush to put your sock on and you get a, a wrinkle, it can create a hot spot, okay? I had a young, talented female runner in the other day, and, you know, her socks, I, I don't even, I, I hate to say she even, you know, they were on. I mean, they were just sort of mishmashed all over the place. You know, the heel counter of her shoe was just destroyed, and she basically was lucky if her shoes were going to stay tied for, you know, the following minute once I start getting her move. And then she's basically doing way too much volume, you know, and yeah. this just sets the stage for trouble. So, you know, again, I'm trying to really foster habits. You know, it's like when I go out to ride my bike, I check the tire pressure. I make sure the brakes are working. It's just this very, I mean, this is how the pros approach things, you know. So I think that there's incredible research out there, but it's also very important to, just really foster habits among runners, you yeah. know. That extend outside of running itself. Yeah, I mean, it's like if you've had a lot to drink the night before, you probably shouldn't be waking up early to try and finish your run before you get to work. I mean, right. that's, a, that's just a, a classic problem, you know. Yeah. Got it. Well, thanks. Jason, anything to add to that? Yeah, um, I'll add... Um, you know, I think, not to discredit you, Chris, but I think the reason why maybe, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the reason why I think you don't have possibly as many um, hurdles or, or troubles is that you're very systematic and efficient and you have a very programmed um, 
way of uh, practicing, which is excellent, and I, uh, I'm extremely, uh, I, I aim for that as well, and I, I, I pride myself on clinical efficiency, um, but I think something in the clinic that I find as a challenge doing a running analysis, even if I make it extremely efficient, I'm already planning that this person's going to come in, I've got a clinical hypothesis, no matter how well prepared I am, and if I even get everything all set up from whatever I'm using, an iPad or whatever it is, um, I still run into insurance limitations. And, and insurance, you know, hopefully we're doing some cash-based running analysis, and I might be opening a big can of worms here, but uh, if someone wants to come into my clinic and they're, they're coming with insurance and I'm a, a provider for their insurance carrier, and let's say they're, if they're post-op or non-post-op, it doesn't really matter, and I'm getting them walking pain-free and they want to get back to running, if I'm going to code properly through an insurance company, 90% uh, of the insurance companies will not take a either motion analysis or high-speed video analysis or even a surface EMG if you have that tool um, because they consider it, they meaning the insurance world, consider it research and 90% uh, of the time you need a prior authorization and or a specific referral from a, a doctor and have X amount of cameras and X amount of space in order for insurance companies to uh, reimburse for that. So one of my frustrations that I have in the point is um, how do you bill appropriately for running analysis and, and really document and bill for what you do because, you know, as a profession, we underbill and under sell ourselves. So, you know, if you're going to do a running analysis, I hate when I have to code gate, you know, because gate and running are really not the same. So one of the hurdles that I've had and I continue to have is how do you bill for a running analysis properly without getting shut down by insurance companies and or because you can't take cash for someone that you're contracted with. So um, I know I there's a creative way. This is a great issue to be discussing. Yeah. Do you have, do you, I mean, are you cash based? Are you insurance based? Are you, I mean, I, I'm not sure what your practice is, is comprised of there, Chris. Well, I mean, when I was in New York, I was out of network uh, with everyone. And, okay. um, you know, but in, in Seattle here, I mean, that's definitely a hurdle. And, you know, I, I think the question becomes, I mean, with a lot of the insurance companies, the second you have someone basically able to stand on their own two feet and breathe, <laughs> they're not, they don't want to pay for anything. Right. Even though running is, you know, I mean, we have to agree that running is an activity of daily living, you know. So it starts to become this gray area, and as physical therapists, obviously we're concerned about our license and, you know, practicing, you know, in accordance with the legalities, you know, mm -hmm. as well as, a, you know, whatever, you know, terms are in place with a, you know, a, an insurance carrier. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a slippery slope, too, and, you know, so I understand offering running analysis to, to people, but this should be part of a, a natural progression when you're rehabbing someone. It's like once they're able to tolerate walking and you get them starting to do some single leg hopping, I mean, you, you need to watch what they're doing with their running because sometimes, you know, you're not going to make any, most of the time, major tweaks, but you need to see them run. I mean, it's like... If someone is, uh, whatever their meaningful task is, if someone's, you know, having trouble lifting and they're doing hard labor, you need to look at how they're lifting. I mean, right. this is pretty straightforward, yet the insurance companies don't really put us in a position to completely rehab these people, so they invariably come back in, you know, if you haven't completed the process, and then the insurance company is only going to be on the hook for more, you know, to basically cover that treatment, you know, Each so, yeah, it's like, let's do things professionally, let's do them, you know, in a complete manner, and try and foster autonomy, but, yeah, that's a, it's a tricky one, I don't think, if anyone has any answer, um, you know, I think what we need to, I think what we need to do, Ryan, is we need to get a uh, insurance, uh, expert, CEO on our next, uh, TV episode, <laughs> That's yeah. a good idea. <laughs> if any experts are watching, tweet us. 
I think the the one thing that I just want to add to that is that running is just one of the um, the facets that we run into trouble with uh, as PTs. You know, there's a lot of buzz right now in ACL uh, rehab as well in returning folks way too early uh, to sport uh, when they're they're at risk for re-injury. And I think it's great that I see some of the members of our field in, in the research uh, realm trying to show uh, the deficits later and trying to show what is appropriate return to sport and trying to prove with research and with evidence, um, you know, whether or not the insurance companies are going to lend their ear uh, to that, that evidence, I can only hope. Uh, but, it, but I think people are trying to show um, what is needed to actually return somebody to sport because they get it as Chris said when it's uh, somebody who does manual labor for work you know it needs to lift properly and needs to be able to lift a certain amount of pounds work comp has it down pat um, but it doesn't apply to those uh, when they call it sport uh, they, they seem to think that sport is not something they're responsible for uh, returning people to as, as soon as they can they can walk right well, thanks, everyone. Um, the next question I have down is, what are the clinical tests you perform on your runners in conjunction with the run analysis? I'll just open it up now to whoever wants to interject. Ladies first, Nicole. Oh, odd man out here. Um, <laughs> hey, what am I? Yeah, that's of the physical well, therapy. Ryan, do you want to answer the question first? No, you don't want me to answer it. <laughs> I think, you know, this is this is another one that um, when I teach the PTs how to do a run analysis or how to work with runners or how to, I should say do the run analysis, how, when I teach them how to approach the runner and how to evaluate them, we as PTs have a thousand tools and a thousand ways to evaluate things, uh, and we like to gather a lot of information. I think what I have um, tried to practice and to preach uh, is that systematic approach, um, as both of you have uh, alluded to, and, and not that one is better than the other, but having a very systematized approach, both on the run analysis and to uh, what you're going to look at with the patients. I think for myself, uh, one of the challenges I run into is that I know joints all the way from the toe when it hits the ground, through the foot, through the ankle, all the way up the totem pole, everything needs to move a certain amount. Everything needs to be flexible, everything at the joint level, at the muscles, uh, the tendons and the ligaments and you know the whole kit and caboodle. And I think the hard part is, is choosing what do we know based on research how much should something move? And so for myself, I do look at first ray mobility, uh, as Chris was talking about. I do look at talocurl mobility, and we're getting a little technical here for, um, for the audience, but I'm basically looking at the kinetic chain, the foot when it hits the ground, and making sure that it can move at least symmetrically. You know, if I don't know, if research doesn't tell me how many degrees it needs to move at a certain joint, at least it should be symmetric. Um, when somebody is moving uh, with their foot as they push back off, land and push back off up the ground. And so I also, I have a lot of, um, not so much in Colorado, but when I was practicing in uh, San Francisco especially, I'm going to go ahead and use them as an example <laughs> for anybody watching, um, I had a lot of desk jockeys, I'll call them, uh, the weekend warriors and the folks that spent who knows how many hours sitting at their desk, you know, typing away uh, and getting all curled up in their hip flexors and in their hamstrings all tight, and then they'd stand up and just start running down Embarcadero or just going for it without uh, doing anything to undo what they had done to get tight all day long. And so hamstrings, for me especially in that realm, became something I could look at. And, you know, I like to choose certain tests that have some sort of research behind it. So I use the straight leg raise 9090 because I know where that should be uh, and I can compare it um, between sides and between people. And obviously, you know, hip flexors, we know, we know that you need to be able to move. And so I'm looking at mobility there. In the gait world, there's the 10 degrees of hip extension that, that we know. I think running makes it a challenge to know how much you should have. And I think depending on the runner that you work with, you know, it does vary. I tend to treat a lot of the ultra runners, the 100 mile runners, and so they get this nice little ultra shuffle going and they really don't extend their legs 
uh, in comparison to somebody who is sprinting or someone who you see um, running a different sort of race. And I treat a lot of trail runners, and so I think balance uh, and proprioception, sort of the ability to know where you are in space, is crucial for those folks. Um, I think what I look at the most is symmetry. So what I've, I've learned gets people into trouble, and this is sort of my clinical observation uh, versus research-based, but looking at asymmetries, how people move, or looking at mobility side to side, and then strength. Uh, and of course, uh, Jason knows I'm going to plug this one, but hip strength is, is crucial. Uh, there's a lot of research behind the glutes and the ability of the glutes to control the leg in space and preventing it from diving inward. And when the leg does dive inward, we know that you're going to end up with knee pain. So that's an area that I can quickly assess, uh, both through the classic PT strengthening test, you know, and doing a functional test, uh, like a hop or like a, a squat, a single leg squat or double, uh, depending on the patient. That was a mouthful. <laughs> Anyone else want to weigh in on clinical tests that you perform in conjunction with the run analysis? Um, uh, for me, um, what Nicole mentioned was, you know, we as physical therapists, I mean, even right when we get out of school, we're just bombarded with so many different tools and how do we use those tools and uh, you know, gait, gait in itself or walking analysis, you know, you've got, you've got your phases and you've got the joints. So there's a lot of things to look at. And then when you get into running or more high speed motion, such as jumping or cutting, it becomes more complicated uh, just based on the different variables of what can be contributing to a patient's pain. So what I do clinically is I really try to simplify things. Um, you know, I, I, I instruct my patients and I look at them and I say, okay, what is going to be the most beneficial area to look at? You know, obviously if they're complaining of an, a joint, I'm not, you know, if they're saying I have toe pain, I'm not going to look at their shoulder, even though posture is definitely a component of it, but I'm going to address the area and really focus on that area and the joints above and below it to see if I can make a clinical impact and a positive change as quick as possible. And, and then use my tools to, to assess whether it be orthopedic joint mobility or tissue length or strength. And, and it may be, you know, an evidence-based clinician's nightmare, but I do really try to dumb things down somewhat, more so just to try to connect with the patient and let them know, hey, okay, this is what's wrong, and this is how we can fix it, and this is what we can do. And I think... Uh, Clinically speaking, I, I feel like my patients really like that approach, um, and I think I, I definitely and, and a lot of other clinicians could probably do a better job using the evidence, but that's where I take the continu continuing education and go to courses like if, such as Chris's and and then, you know, just have really good resources like, you know, Therapedia has and then, uh, you know, speakers like Chris here we can just keep communicating with. That way we can stay on, uh, on top of what research we can reference. Chris, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot. I think, obviously, you have to be able to conduct a solid orthopedic examination, you know. But that really takes all of, you know, I, I try and, when students come and train with me, I try and get that down to, like, literally three minutes, you know. Mm -hmm. You have to look at ACL integrity, MCL, PCL. But, you know, most of the time, these are not injuries that runners are coming in with. I mean... You know, runners, obviously, know, we know from Van Gent's work, Tautendall's work, you know, it's predominantly knee issues, you know, patellofemoral pain, uh, patellar tendinosis, um, you know, as well as foot issues, you know. So I think when someone comes to see us, there are two main reasons why they come to see us. And I just put it out there right out, you know, from literally the second they walk in the door, they want to know when can I run and basically what can I do about this pain. You know, so I think it's very important to, you know, to talk to people about pain, not talk to them like they're a chronic pain patient, but to, you know, to really spend time discussing the implications of pain. And I think we have more resources now than ever before 
Um, and then from there to, again, make sure that you have an understanding of the performance demands of the sport. And this is something that I think we have to just continue to deconstruct and start looking at where are they along the spectrum. You know, so the, the FMS is out there and, you know, that's gained a lot of traction. It's also come under a lot of fire from people in the research community, which, you know, I think there's a burden of proof there. But I think with running... It would it would really lend itself to some degree to a movement screen more than any other activity because it's predictable. It's basically typically running in a straight plane. Obviously, you get trail runners, and there's different velocities at stake. But um, you know, it's understanding the runner who's in front of you. Again, their past medical history and any risk factors that have been documented in the literature, and then to systematically look at things and. You know, you can use a bottom-up or a top-down approach, but, you know, we have to agree that the first thing that's coming in contact with the ground is, is the foot. You know, so... Hopefully. Think, yeah, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> so, you know, and again, it, it's tricky. So Nicole was saying, you know, rightfully so, you know, you have to look at, you know, the first ray. You have to look at MTP motion. But the question becomes, I mean, Jay DeSherry talked about this in his paper in 2010 from, you know, basically from the lab to the clinic. You know, you typically want about 30 degrees of MTP motion, and less than that starts to become problematic. But the question then becomes, how are you measuring that? Is that a weight-bearing? Is it non-weight-bearing? Is the ankle in neutral dorsiflexion or whatever sub tailor neutral is? I mean, there's so many question marks, so I think you have to apply the literature where you can, but also just look at things in a systematic manner and really focus on building capacity with runners, building strength and motor control, and then from there, starting to work them back into their routine and get them answering some simple questions. I, I'm starting to get a little bit off topic, but this is what I would want someone to know who is watching this. I mean... Before you go out to a run, I mean, when I wake up in the morning and I'm trying to figure out my training, how much sleep did I get the night before? What was the quality of sleep? Did I fuel properly that morning? Are there any stressors that I should be mindful of? Am I recovered from the previous day? You know, so it's, it's all these little things that I think sometimes, you know, fall by the wayside and they become very meaningful because, again, it's getting back to habits, but... Um, you know, I, I think the only other, uh, well, I'm not even going to open up the Pandora's box. We're getting into minimalist footwear and barefoot, but. Um, <laughs> Tempting. So I, thought, I think it's to answer your question. Yeah, there's, I don't think there's, you know, any specific group of special tests. You know, I think it's looking at each individual runner and how they present and what their complaint is, you know, and trying to return them to running in a timely manner without violating the RTF rule, which I always bring up, which is rush to failure, you know, because if you don't systematically work on this person, they will get exposed, and I never, my greatest fear or concern is for a runner who's been progressing nicely to prematurely allow them to go out and run, and anytime, you know, they use the words try running, I know disaster is imminent, because they'll blow, they'll blow up. I mean, and this happens time and time again. And the less it happens, that means the more you're starting to gain a specialization in running injury management. You know. Yeah, that's great. Um, so we're actually getting close to the hour mark. So as with my uh, my powers as moderator, I'm going to choose the question that I'm most interested in hearing some answers on, and. Um, that is, what are the knowns for research regarding running versus what are the anecdotal advice you hear in the running community, and how do you address this with your runners? And uh, Nicole, let's start with you. Because <laughs> you know that's my uh, the bane of my existence, maybe. <laughs> um, you know, I will say it's a challenge. Um, there are a lot of very respected um, running coaches and runners themselves and um, people who have created uh, running styles or running uh, almost lifestyles, I'll call it, like chi running is an example of that, or pose running. 
Um, and so I think, you know, the challenge is as a PT, sometimes we have an instinct to come in in the defensive mode saying research doesn't show that that's true or there is no research to show that is true. And I think what I always try to keep in mind is that maybe research hasn't looked at it yet or hasn't looked at things in a proper way. So I try to approach all of the things that patients uh, or runners tell me, any questions that I get with that, that model. I was in um, San Francisco uh, when I was helping UCSF start up Run Safe and developing that program. There was a guy called uh, Chris McDougall uh, who had written this book called Born to Run. And so that was the first we started seeing. Uh, all of a sudden, I'd come walking out of work, and on the Embarcadero, people would be running without shoes. Uh, or when I worked, I used to run one of the medical tents at San Francisco Marathon, and I will not forget how many runners came in that year uh, pretty beat up uh, because they decided to take off their shoes and go ahead and just run because the book said it was the right way to do it. Uh, but they hadn't trained for it, so they hadn't investigated what might happen if they ran a full 26.2 miles uh, without shoes. And so I think that's where I started getting tossed into as the mediator between the two worlds, um, the research world and the, um, in the clinician world and the running community. And so research that is known, as I was saying earlier, is still developing. You know, I do know that if you have your knees knock in together and you have weakness in the glutes, you're pretty likely to have knee pain, patellofemoral pain, anterior knee pain. So I feel confident when I see somebody with that and I screen for it that I know I need to correct it. There is research that shows if you're an overstrider, meaning you land with your foot, you strike your foot in front of your center of mass, front of your pelvis, I know that you're going to have a higher reaction force from the ground coming up, and I know you are more likely to have injuries such as stress fractures or knee pain. Um, you know, Brian Heiderscheidt did that research, and so I feel like when I see that, I know I should address it. I think there's developing research um, with Irene Davis looking at the foot strike patterns and loading, and there is convincing evidence that shows that a forefoot pattern, forefoot strike pattern, might be able to diminish certain injuries. Now that doesn't mean that it's going to add, take away all injuries because it's going to load other parts of the body when you adopt that pattern. <coughs> and so I think, you know, getting back to the who is applying the research and who is looking at uh, the runner themselves, I think the important part is knowing when to apply that research uh, and when to know um, what is still developing in the research world. You know, um, the article that um, Chris was alluding to, uh, I use that when I teach the CU students because I think it gives a great um, breakdown of the biomechanics and the angles. But as Chris also said, how do we measure that? Do we measure that live? Do we measure that with the foot on the ground? Do we measure that statically on the table? And so I think that's still a challenge uh, for us. Uh, we're, we're getting there, we're getting some evidence, but I, I feel like we don't have all the pieces of the puzzle. You know, and is it five years from now? We're going to look back and, and sort of wonder how we didn't know that before. Uh, I hope so, because I hope we'll have some evidence to, to guide us a little bit as clinicians uh, and as physical therapists. Thanks, Nicole. Chris, do you want to weigh in on that one? Uh, just so, asking what are the knowns for research versus anecdotal things you hear in the running community? Uh, yeah, overstriding, overstriking, poor femoral rotation control, and sloppy ankle dorsiflexion are problems. Don't think a shoe is going to fix your injuries. It can affect your running. It's not going to be a solution to it. And running is not easy. Running takes time. I've been running for 36 years now, and I can honestly say that within the past five, I've learned how to run, and I was running uh, very fast at a young age. But, you know, when you start to get into distance, I mean, a lot of the research, I mean, the 10% rule has been sort of debunked a little bit, you know. Um, you know, I, I think that at day's end, you know, I may have brought this up before, but 80% of runners run at 80% of effort 80% of the time, which is why upwards of 80% get injured, okay? You have to mix up your pace and intensity, short runs, longer runs. 
And if you're doing anything else beyond running, I'm going to bite off Greg Lehman here. Um, you should probably be doing some form of strength training, you know. But I think that you have to revel in the. I put all this stuff online regarding motor control and the slow motion stuff because it gives people the chance to internally audit. And if you are running a lot and there are some impairments that are meaningful, it probably sets a stage for an injury and it's just a matter of volume or excessive volume or improper pacing or under recovery that's going to lead to that. But connect with a PT who specializes in it, um, who also is willing to maintain communication with, if you have a coach, I think coach, there's some incredible coaches out there, especially here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but generally, it's it's having good communication lines with a runner and making sure that you're on the same page, and um, and that's ultimately what's going to get them back running healthy and you know for a longer period of time. Right. Thanks, Chris. Jason, anything? That I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it short and sweet since I know we're we're kind of wrapping up here. Um, there's a ton of evidence that can be quoted. Uh, I think Nicole and Chris summarized very, very well that some of it may not be applicable to our patients um, because it is in a research setting. You know, was it weight-bearing, non-weight-bearing? But um, I just want to I want to summarize in, a, in an easy statement, not to discourage people out there that are watching or listening or whatever it may be, uh, but I, I'm, I'm going to quote this. You have to be fit to run you should not run to get fit. And, and, and what I mean by that is, as a physical therapist, it is our job to tell you and instruct you and help you become biomechanically sound to prepare for that movement. You shouldn't run to get fit. You have to have the proper tools to run. And that's what it means by you, you have to be fit to run, you should not run to get fit. And I think that summarizes kind of our whole talk. <clears throat> yeah, that's a great one. Thanks, Jason. So unfortunately, nobody had anything to comment. Um, we must have a shy audience. So uh, <laughs> we got we got some people talking about it on Twitter, but nothing really tweeted at us. Um, so to wrap up, I just wanted to make sure that anyone who's watching can connect with each of you if they wanted to. So. If we could go around and just tell us where we can find you, any website URLs, social media, um, any resources you want to point people to, uh, go for it, Nicole. Uh, I think the easiest thing would be to go to therapediaboulder.com. Uh, that does have links, uh, has my email on there. It's got links to the social media um, that we like to post on. Um, and anyone is welcome to reach out to me if they would like some specific references. Um, as well, uh, either for uh, resources as people they should talk to or references as in uh, research articles. I'm happy to help with that as well. Uh, it's Nicole at therapediaboulder.com uh, and easiest to find everything you need on, on that website. Great. Jason? Uh, I am also on Therapedia, uh, but instead of Boulder, unfortunately I'm not in Boulder. I'd love to come visit Nicole sometime, but I'm Therapedia Portland. So if you look up therapediaportland.com, uh, I too have uh, our website with all our social media links and contact information. Uh, my email should be on there, but in case you wanted, it's jason at therapediaportland.com. Great. Okay, and Chris, where can we find you? Thanks again for you guys uh, connecting. I, you know, I'm surprised that we haven't spoken before cross paths. So, you know, you guys are obviously all on point. And uh, thanks, Ryan, for hosting this again. Um, I try and put out so much information for for folks, you know, and just as a resource. Most of it's uh, on Chris Johnson PT on YouTube. Um, I haven't been writing as much because I'm not riding riding the subways like I was in New York. I'm on my bike trying to avoid people hitting me while texting and driving. Um, so, but Chris at ChrisJohnsonPT.com is my email. Chris Johnson PT on YouTube. Um, and look, there's plenty of resources out there. You know, if anyone's ever in Seattle, feel just give me a shout and uh, and you know feel free to come and hang. 
um, you know, and, and other folks out there that I, you know, obviously some of the names that we've discussed in the literature, I think it's very important to be familiar with them. Um, I think uh, otherwise just continue to stay current with the literature, hang out with people um, who are coaches and, and work with, you know, gifted runners and also step out of uh, step out of the running world and it's amazing what you, what you'll learn I spent some time with a uh, Olympic caliber speed skater today and so much of this stuff relates to running you know so um, so anyways we could go on all night I'm sure guys so thanks again thanks for your this. time uh, yeah I still have a whole list of uh, questions so maybe we'll have to do a round two soon sure. Um, so thanks again, Chris. Thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, and just as a reminder to everyone, you can find more sessions like this, roundtable discussions about physical therapy on therapedia.com. And if you want to continue the discussion, you can do so on Twitter using the hashtag TherapediaRunTalk. So thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks. You too, Ryan. Hey, are you guys free to hang for a little bit? Yes, sure. definitely. I'll yeah, just uh, stop the broadcast and we can chat still. Okay. Thanks. Bye.